Tonight, expand those summer reading lists. Best-selling author of the Kingdom Keepers and Peter and the Star Catchers series, Ridley Pearson joins us to talk about writing great stories for kids and much more. And later, mega bestseller Dean Koontz interviews me about Will Wilder, the relic of Perilous Falls. We'll talk about the importance of literacy, the craft of writing, and oh, wait till we tell you the secrets. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. This is a special show devoted to literacy. Before we start, for you folks in Orange County and Southern California, I'm coming your way on Saturday, August 6th. I'll be at the Freed Theater at the Christ Cathedral Campus talking about Will Wilder and Mother Angelica and much more. It's going to be an intimate evening with a talk, lots of Q&A. I hope you can join me and bring the family. I'll sign books afterwards. You can join me for the fun on August 6th. Details and the link to tickets are at RaymondArroyo.com. Now let's get down to business. He has written more than four dozen best-selling books for kids and adults. You probably know him best for his highly successful Kingdom Keepers and Peter and the Star Catchers series. He's a notorious workaholic, as well as an extensive researcher. I spoke with him recently to discuss storytelling and his book, The Return, book one of the Disneylands. Here is my exclusive interview with New York Times best-selling author Ridley Pearson. And Ridley, Thank you, Raymond. What an honor to have it's you. Appreciate here. to be here. My my family, particularly my boys, are rabid Kingdom Keepers fans. Well, you better and, lock them up. That means there's something wrong. With well, them. you know, and and I'm so glad for we, that. Well, we go to the Disney parks, and the first time we saw the very first Kingdom Keepers book, it was there at the Disney parks, and they've kept reading every one of them. How many do you have now? This is uh, eight? Yeah, this is eight, and I've just finished nine. Wow. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get into that whole series, but I want to back up a little bit. I want to talk about you, your family. You come from a musical and literary family, both your mom and dad. Yeah, I do. Um, I, there was a lot of creativity. And, you know, when you're, when you're talking to middle schools, as we both do, yeah. uh, you get the question of sort of how did you get into this. And it dawned on me that my, my grandfather on my mother's side if you can believe this, was born in 1864, I think, or 1883, I'm sorry, 1883, and he uh, strung telegraph wire across the West. So he had stories. He would literally sit me on his knee and tell stories about living with Native Americans uh, mm. back in the early 1900s, and I'm sure he made it all up, but it w they were great they were stories. Oh, my gosh. And my paternal grandfather uh -huh. um, was one of these guys who could memorize long-form poetry. So he would sit you on his lap in a different visit and recite Charge of the Light Brigade or one of these, you know, 90-minute uh -huh. poems. Mm -hmm. And so I think this oral storytelling, d despite that my father was a writer, my mom was a fine, mm -hmm. fine artist, this, this idea of sort of always telling story Got in me from in a very blood. little, very little boy, very, very young age. But then you're in college, and then you leave college. Yeah. You go off to be a musician. Yeah, I went off to try to be James Taylor. How did uh, that work out? Yeah, well, yeah. you, but you toured for a while. What I was did, it, yeah, like 11, six years, no, seven years, years, more than yeah. that? And I wrote about 300 songs. Um, and, and, and how does that, how did the music writing and performing shape and help you today? It's, uh, I don't think, there are two big pieces that I think helped me be a writer. One is I went to a boarding school called Pomfret School, and um, it taught me, you know, you learn all these things in high school and all of that, but it taught me how to study, hmm. and it taught me self-discipline. Um, so, so that was just gigantic, and, and you, in a band, you learn that when you turn your song over to these four or five other guys, mm -hmm. and I would write, I, I score, so I, we had a flute and cellos and all these things, Boy. and I would put all that in front of everybody, and it would sound just great. And then about three months into touring it, 
I would go, well, that's not the stuff I wrote, and it sounded really good. <laughs> and I realized that role of collaborative effort, mm. which is what The Kingdom Keepers is about. It's yeah. Yeah. five kids collaboratively trying to solve puzzles and defeat these people who want to take over the Disney Kingdom. The overtakers. overtakers. And we'll get into those momentarily. Um, you write for eight and a half years before you're ever published. Yeah, yeah, that was that whole music. How did you keep that? You were touring at the time and you're I was, writing? I was playing a lot of music at the time and I was writing about six hours a day, seven days a week. Oh my God. I wrote 11 screenplays for television, teleplays in those days. None of them sold. Um, I and wrote what kept you going? Three no oh, I just love telling stories. You know, I think, oh. I think if you. You know, there's, you can't really teach writing. You can teach better writing, mm -hmm. but you have to. You've got the bug. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to. You're afflicted. Gotta get, <laughs> yeah, you're afflicted. Something's got to get you up at six in the morning behind the chair, other than a paycheck or this or that. You mm -hmm. want to do it, right? You you have to. And share I've just this. always loved doing it. I was the guy in middle school who would tell all the fiction to match make. I'd say, you know, Tommy really has a crush on you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and the girl would go, really, really? And you know, Tommy had no idea who this person was. You just wanted to see the I clash. I just wanted to make it happen. Watch yeah. the drama, I yeah. love it. Uh, tell me about Lou Bolt, who is your protagonist he in is. a number of thrillers. He is you, in... you wrote thrillers initially. Yeah, and still do. Yep. Um, I wrote uh, police procedurals uh, with Lou Bolt and a character named Daphne Matthews. Yeah. And, you know, they early on when you're writing, as you know, they say, write what you know or what right. you love. But you didn't and know policing, No, did I didn't, but I loved reading those kinds of books. Uh -huh. And so I um, devoted myself to really study. And I do a ton of research still for all these yeah. books and because it's the really fun part. You said and you put point. fact into fiction. Yeah. And, and Lou Bolt came out of my imagination. Mm -hmm. And then three and a half years, four years into writing him, I met him. A, a guy, a, a cop walks I in. Had, and you well, I, yeah, I had heard about this guy, Don Cameron, on the Seattle Police Force, and this prosecuting attorney had used one of my books to help solve a crime. A murder. And he said, "Is there any, if there's ever anything I can do for And I said, stop. Can you get me a sit down with Don Cameron? I'd tried to get this probably six times. And he said, I bet I can. And so Don Cameron saw me. He, he interviewed me in the interrogation room <laughs> instead of his office. <laughs> and, and so I swing this door open, and it was Lou Bolt. It was oh, the very character. It looks like the character and come I to talked life. to him for like 90 minutes, and I said, I'm sorry if I'm tripping all over myself, but you are Lou Bolt. And, and he's a very slash mouth guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this little grin comes on. He goes, Ridley, I know I'm Lou Bolt. I've read all the books. <laughs> oh you know, so God. it was a marriage made in heaven. I love it. it. Great. Uh, you, that, you, you talked a moment ago about the research you do, and you do extensive research, even for these uh, do, Kingdom even, Keepers yeah, books, which we'll get into books. in a moment. Yeah. Um, you were researching a book called The First Victim and then The Pied Piper, mm. and it led you to a special little girl. It did. Tell me about that. It led that. us to Story Pearson. Um, Your daughter. Uh, yeah, my wife and I had both talked about how we love adoption, uh, when we were courting, huh. and then I wrote, I wrote those two books, and um, it was during Pied Piper, which is about um, some people sneaking into the country in a container ship, which doesn't seem novel anymore, but back then it had only happened once that anybody knew of. And on my desk, which was the dining room table at the time, she saw a statistic that 30,000 little girls in China were moved into orphanages every year mm. and about 2,000 got out to adoption. And she said, remember when we talked about adoption? This is, this is where our next child comes from. And, uh, and so, so now we have a junior in high school who's been mm -hmm. with us since she was four and a half months old as the, the light of our lives along with Paige. And uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been just a terrific, terrific working out. And, and one of your daughters was responsible for Peter and the Star Catchers, which people know now not only from the books and the yes. series, but the Broadway but a play. play, which yeah, I saw, a beautiful play, so and it's now it's, it's toured the country, it's yeah. been everywhere. Yeah, yeah. What was the, the, the germ of this Well, you know idea? how as writers we're always looking for ideas, mm -hmm. and um, like you, I'm sure I have an abundance of ideas, but I'm always observant. I always try to keep my ears and eyes open. And I tell, tell kids this, you know, that if you want to be a writer, keep your ears and eyes open. And I was reading to my then five-year-old daughter, who's now 18 and a student mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And um, she said to me, we were reading Peter Pan, and she said to me, how did Peter meet Captain Hook? Huh. And I said, well, I'll be darned. How come Peter can fly? Why did he never grow old? 
and mm-hmm. all the prequel ideas flooded into me. Where did he meet Captain Hook? Wow. Tinkerbell, where'd she come from? On and on and on. And uh, I play in a rock and roll band with a whole bunch of crazy authors, mm-hmm. including Dave Barry. And Stephen and King Stephen and Amy King, Tan. Amy Tan, Scott Turow, Mitch yeah. Album. Yeah. Uh, and I was staying at Dave's house to play one of these shows and mentioned this to Dave, and his eyes kind of went wide. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about writing this prequel, and I kill people for a living in my <laughs> murder mysteries, and you write booger jokes. And, you know, could Perhaps we, we, could work could we together? make something that was suspenseful but funny and do it together? And or a murderous booger. And table and said, I'm in. Yeah, I so, love it. And that was it. Went, that was it. And you all did multiple we, books we ended in up two series. ten books together, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, then The Kingdom Keepers comes along. Yes. Where did this originate? And tell me about... Have you ever been to the Disney Park? Where is that? Where, where are in those? Orlando, Florida. Oh, I think I might have gone there once or twice. So I went there once as a only one time some year old. Oh, never wow. had been. What? I grew up to the wonderful world of color. I was Disney everything, but I'd never been to the park. Yeah, I grew up in New Orleans, and um, we would make the pilgrimage sometimes oh, twice a year. Well, it's worth going five times well, a year. But I went for the first time in my 40s with our kids oh. and with Dave Barry oh, um, and his family. And after the fireworks, you walk out, right. and there's 80,000 of you leaving the park. Mm-hmm. And I looked around, and that day, I, I know we've shared some photos. I had also met Mickey Mouse oh. and some of the princesses, <laughs> um, and really just had the most special day. Oh. And none of the characters were leaving the park. And I had what I call my Toy Story moment. You know, when Andy's door shuts and the toys come alive, mm-hmm. I thought, so what does happen for these next nine hours when no one's here? And, and I just could picture Mickey and people peering around their doors going, Have the, they left yet? <laughs> is the coast you know? clear? Yeah. And then what's that world? And that became the kingdom. Mm. And where did the overtakers come from? These are the villains. The overtakers came from Walt Disney's unbelievable creative imagination and the fact that he borrowed from the Brothers Grimm some terrific dark characters. Mm-hmm. And they either get slapstick time or they get very little time at all in the animated features. Right. And it bugged me because he had really good, dark, deep characters Villains, yeah. that weren't getting used. And I thought they would be upset about this. You know, like, <laughs> why are we always made fun of? And why is this park so fun? Why can't it be mean and scary? Mm. And that they would want to take the park over, mm. get rid of all these stupid little fluffy characters, <laughs> and it would be Maleficent's park. So. There is a redemptive edge in these books there that is. I've seen. And my boys have read them. My little girl's reading them now. Um, th- there is a strong sense of good versus evil, right. justice. Your thrillers are marked by that same sensibility. Are you aware of that? I am very aware of that. Yeah, and I believe in that. Tell me, I, I was I was impressed to come across something. You you said in an interview you read the Bible every day. I do. Why? And how does it affect your? Wife? <coughs> Excuse me. My wife introduced me to that idea. You know, not only a little prayer to get you started in the day. Mm-hmm. But to read the Bible, and they're the greatest stories that are there, for one thing. Yeah, and they and, and, and they're that the basis of every story that we read, really. Yeah, and um, amazing characters, and the Christ's life is is so beginning, middle, and end, mm-hmm. and it's the way all drama has been shaped since the Greeks is beginning, yeah. middle, and end, yeah. with including a resurrection piece at the end. Yeah, um, so it's. It doesn't hurt, you know, to rub, rub up against the greats. Like, yeah. that's, and, 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 and that one's pretty great. And, you know, on a spiritual side, it just, it's, it's instructive and calming and soothing. And uh, I think um, it, it, you know, although I get teased about it by some of my friends, it's, um, it works for me. I'm not saying it's for everybody. Yeah. It just works for yeah. me. Tell me, uh, because I, I, when I read that, I thought people don't realize. People, people see these books. And they say, wow, this, this must be great to, to, to be an author. To... They don't realize when, you, and, it, and it, there, is, there is something great sure. about it. And it's wondrous and wonderful that you can share a piece of your own heart and understanding and, and let someone else go on that journey and find their own way through it. There is also, you and I know, when you're sitting at that desk alone, watching other people live life or hearing about it, there is a heavy cost to it. And you're carrying all these worlds and people around in your head that no one else has access to until it's published. Does it help you cope with that 
does the spiritual I'm sure it does. Yeah, I'm side sure sort does. of help you yeah. Just get like singing that. a hymn does. I mean, uh -huh. it, you know, it frees up your, it gets you focused on something else. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, because I write multiple books, um, there's How many a, do you do a year? I'm doing three right now. But, simultaneously? You know, simultaneously. Um, and during the Dave Barry years, it was two and a half, which <sighs> made me think I might be able to do three, and I think it was a mistake. But, oh you know, you've got a lot of stories and a lot of characters and just a lot going on in your head. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. I mean, yeah. I'm not claiming it's harder work than anything else, but um, it's busy up there. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's nice to still that and find a quiet place. Mm. And it's nice to bring some of those ideas into the work. Yeah. One of the early parts of the Kingdom Keepers is that these kids are actually holograms in the park. Right. That's how I worked it out with Disney attorneys to allow me to wreak <laughs> havoc in their park. But DHI technology. DHI, yeah, daylight hologram imaging. Or but Disney host interactive. True. Mm. Boy, you have read well, this, Raymond. I, uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm there. I'm so there's, there's a piece of it early on, and I carry it through the whole deal, which is that these, these kids are holograms, mm -hmm. but that if they allow fear into themselves, they begin to get solid. They begin to lose that hologram, and they are very vulnerable at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the other answer to your Bible thing, is I think the more we can keep fear out of our lives, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, more, the, the easier our lives are than when we let fear in. Tell me about the return. This is this book. The Kingdom it's Keepers had story. grown up. Yeah, uh, graduated bit, yeah. high school. Yeah. Now Wayne, who's the Imagineer, kind of the Merlin character. Yeah, uh, yeah he's, he is. He's dying. They go back in time. Tell me about this. I, I wrote seven books, and I am that architect you asked about. So I had planned the entire series, and it, I tied it off at the end. And then my publisher, of course, came and said, could you write some more Kingdom Keepers books? I said, I tied it off. You know? <laughs> it's done. It's done. And they said, is there any other idea you could? I said, oh, I have a lot of ideas, but none are lighting me on fire. And I had a 10-year-old boy email me and say, what if Finn Whitman, and he didn't know I was even thinking about other ideas. He said, what if Finn Whitman got on King Arthur Carousel? And it went around and around. He started feeling a little dizzy, and he started feeling a little woozy. And he stepped off the carousel, and it wasn't where he got off. Mm. But it was 1955 and the opening of the parks. Oh my! God. And I went, well, there's the next series. So there it is. It's a three-book series, and the second one comes out at the end of March. The Return, book one, Disneyland's by Ridley Pearson, is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. And for more great stories and authors, be sure to follow my literacy initiative, Storyented, at storyented.com. And tell us how the story you've read as a child or an adult changed your life and what you learned from it. You could win a copy of a signed first edition from one of our featured authors. That's storyented.com. Now, for something I haven't done in two decades of hosting this show, my next guest is a New York Times best-selling author with 450 million books sold and counting. He's also one of the foremost masters of suspense writing today. He interviewed me recently about my book for kids of all ages, Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls. It's the first installment of my Will Wilder series, and what a pleasure to hand the floor over to Dean Koontz. He sat down with me at our EWTN studio in beautiful Orange County, California. Take a look. Uh, Dean, thanks so much for being here. Well, so take it away. This is a great pleasure for me. You've interviewed me a number of times, and it's always appeared to be lovely. But you didn't know that I left the stage bitter. <laughs> so now is, now this is payback. Now it's payback. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I think, be kind, be I'll, gentle. I'm not used uh, to sitting over I'll here. I'll do so. my best. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, uh, as you know, I read Will Wilder some time ago. You did and, indeed. And, uh, Gave you a little blurb for it because I liked it. It's kind of book when I was a child. I wished I could have had more of. So. Uh, oh, thank you. And uh, but where did this series originate, and where did you get Will Wilder from? Well, as you know, his name wasn't always Will Wilder. His first name came out. I often say Will Wilder was born as a soap opera because <laughs> when I was bathing the children, they'd be in the bubbles up to their necks, and they'd demand stories, fresh stories. Tell us about something. Give us a story. And just to keep them occupied, I came up with this impetuous 12-year-old kid and his kind of wacky, dysfunctional family members. And they loved the slapstick nature of it. Every now and then I wove in a little supernatural thing or something scary. 
and I saw their response to it. But originally, this character was named Kerman Derman, which mm -hmm. I bared, I don't even want to say because it's so hard to pronounce. And uh, I'll tell you later why it, it changed. But that's where the character came from. It was really something to entertain the children. I went back then and sort of deepened, as you know, mm -hmm. we have to do this. You, you come up with a backstory. And I was an actor. You know, I was trained as an actor. There was a woman, Stella Adler, who I worked with oh. for years. Stella was a legend in yes. the theater, trained Marlon Brando and a lot of great people. Uh, Stella had this technique where when you approached a script, you as an actor would go and write the backstory. You wrote your own biography and what does this character want? What is its uh, uh, action in this scene? I built these characters the same way. I did a lot of background research, if you will. And as I wrote their backstory, the series basically presented itself. Uh -huh. And I saw where the family came from. Will Wilder has a great grandfather, Jacob Wilder, who pops up at the top of each of these books. He's kind of a collector of relics and um, an adventurer himself. And Will is following in his great grandfather's footsteps in some ways. So that's where the series came from. I really wanted to entertain kids. And then it became something much more. Well, I wish you a great deal of luck with this because I think the marketplace needs it. Thank you. How much of you is in Will? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I, I, I imagine like you, we've never talked about this, but I'll ask you in a second. My feeling is when I read it, I'm in all these characters. I play all the parts. I see bits of myself in all of them from, you know, Will to the father to, you know, Aunt Lucille and, and uh, uh, even a, a rather ancient evil that pops up in the book, which, I'm, no, I'm not going to tell you how I'm like that character, but there is a little bit of me in all of, in all of them. But I was an impetuous kid like Will. I, I would sort of get something into my mind and run at it. Um, I think I'm still like that, but, but, I w but certainly when I was younger, I was really, uh, I gave my poor parents a run for their money. So that, that little bit is absolutely like me. But the rest of the character, he's his own little person. They, they take on their own identities as you write them. Yeah, they, they definitely do. And uh, people often say to me, how can you write women characters? Right. Legally? And I always say, because there's a piece of me in them. Uh -huh. And it always surprises me that people don't realize there's a piece of you in each character. Yeah, yeah, that, and, but, it, but there is, and you don't, but I don't, I, it's almost as if I don't realize it until I go back, or as you've said before, your wife reads it, mm -hmm. who knows you better than anybody, and Rebecca will tell me, oh, I see uh, so-and-so in that character, or this is you, isn't it? And, well, it's not me, but it's a piece of me, and yeah. she saw it where I, I didn't. And you do kind of come, one of the amazing things about this series, writing it, as you tell the story, it does reveal itself to you. And there are things in this book that, frankly, I didn't put there. They mm -hmm. came out, they fell out in the telling. And people said, oh, I love I loved how this, you know, you, you really, the, the nature of good and evil, and I, this is what I got from the book. Well, I didn't intend any of those things. I just wanted to tell an entertaining tale that my children would enjoy and families would enjoy. But I now realize that it's much more than that. Yeah, it's, that's what happens to you. When yeah. You touch your creativity. I think I said to you recently, you find yourself in touch with the higher creativity. Yeah. And I think that's where these things come from. What research did you do for this? Because oh, it's a research-heavy book, I think. It, yeah, there was a lot of research for the book. I mean, in some ways, I feel I've spent my whole life researching this book because of the acting background. That helped me get close emotionally to these characters. But then I had the challenge of the relics. And we have, at the center of Perilous Falls, at the center of the town, is this museum of antiquities, historical relics that Will has access to, a 12-year-old kid. And the, the story is basically, he, he is involved in an accident, he injures his brother, and Will is punished. And as a way to get out of the punishment, when he realizes his great-grandfather has not only secured this relic that supposedly has the powers to hold back the floodwaters of the town, but healing properties, Will thinks, Okay, I don't really believe this, but if I can borrow that relic, heal my brother, I'll get out of my punishment and everything will be fine. I'll, then I'll bring the relic back. Easy peasy. It doesn't quite turn out like that for Will. But I, once I committed to that trajectory, I had to figure out what relics exist, which do I want to use in the story and in the future of the series. Mm -hmm. And as you know from writing Odd Thomas and your other series, 
that first book is critical because you're really laying the foundation for everything that follows. So I spent a lot of time um, figuring out which relics I was going to use. A lot of what's here, the opening scene in the book, Will Wilder's grandfather uh, secures a relic in Ortona, Italy in the 1940s during the war. That scene actually happened. Huh? The, the, the cathedral was demolished, the Nazis blew it up, and some of the other facts are accurate. Now, Jacob Wilder didn't run into the ruins, but in my book he does. Yes. So I did a lot of historical research, research on the relics, and, um, and the rest of it kind of fell into place imaginatively. Yeah, one thing you've done really, I'm sure you recognize it in this first book, is you've left it be open enough in a series, you can make the mistake of closing yourself down and yeah. not realizing you're doing it. Oh, but no. You've got a world here that can keep opening up. Well, that was the hard part, creating the world of perilous falls that Will would live in. I wanted an imaginative world that kids could feel at home in, but that had possibilities of adventure and little dark shadows. Uh, what I discovered talking to librarians, homeschoolers, teachers, boys particularly are reluctant readers. Mm -hmm. And they love not only adventure, but they like to be scared. So I walk right up to the line, and I was inspired by a few other writers here and there, <laughs> including the guy at the table with me. So it was, you know, that, you, in your books, I've always marveled at, you plant, your intention isn't to scare. Your intention is to walk us into places that perhaps we've never explored before. Mm -hmm. And we, we're scared in the process, <laughs> but you never cross, it's not gory, it's not gratuitous. No, no. But it is um, evocative and suspenseful, yeah. and it's 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 a real gift. I mean, yours, well, not mine. How difficult was it for you with your career in TV to find the time to do this? Well, look, I, I always tell people if I if I could pick one person I could have the daily schedule of, it would be Dean Koontz, <laughs> because one one of the things I love about your work and you see it, you hear it when you read your works. They, they read fleetly, you're lost in the imaginative world because the writer was lost in that imaginative world first. And it takes a lot of time to, just to immerse yourself there. Um, so uh, my wife, thank God, was so indulgent and is all the time. She took over basketball practices and brought my dinners downstairs, which allowed me four or five hour stretches in the evening. You know, some people golf, some people watch TV. I talk to my imaginary friends at the keyboard. <laughs> that's, what, that's how it happens. And, um, and, I, and, and I enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed the trip. It's easier for me now to go back to Perilous Falls. Earlier on, it was harder because you were creating mm -hmm. the walls, the trees, the blocks. Where is this? How does this fit in? Once you've seen it in your mind, you can revisit it. Right. Yeah. But it's hard when you're building it, yeah. as you know. Mm -hmm. I wish you'd warned me. Dean, I would have had somebody else write this no, series. Let, let everybody <laughs> suffer with the person. Oh, thanks. The <laughs> bleeding. You see the blood on every page. Hopefully it's not apparent. <laughs> Why did you want to write middle grade? You know, um, people have asked me that. You've written so much for adults. Why, why do you want to write for kids? But I really, I like that uh, L. Frank Baum line, the author of The Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. He often said, I write for the young and the young at heart. And that's really who I'm writing for. I mean, there are things you can do in children's fiction mm -hmm. because they're still open. There's still a sense of awe and wonder that they have. They'll go further down that path with you more quickly than an mm -hmm. adult will. And I think the reason half, half of the readers of Kids Lit, which I didn't know, 50% are people 18 and older. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're all thirsting for that adventure, that sense of awe and wonder and the spectacular, the miraculous. And that's all in this story. And I wanted people to take that journey. And as you and I have talked about before, books have, have healing properties. Mm -hmm. Books, um, I think particularly when you're in that beautiful age between 5 and 13 or 14, you're still being formed. You're on the precipice of adulthood, yet you still have the eyes of a child. And that's a great time to capture an audience and you have their attention. It leaves a deeper mark, I think, when you read as a young person. And that, that I, I, wanted, I wanted to be at that table. I wanted to invite people to that table. I, uh, I've, I've always been a reader of young adult fiction. Uh, really? As long as I can remember from when I was a young adult to now. Really? And, uh, and so I think you're right about that. The readership spans and it's a good way to go. It does. How is this series different from other middle grade oh, series? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it is different in this sense. 
Uh, Miss Rowling had her witchcraft and wizardry was kind of the central axis of her series. Uh, Rick Reardon has the Percy Jackson series and Greek gods and, and uh, Greek mythology is the centerpiece of that. Mine, it's sacred antiquities, historical relics. That is the centrifuge that sort of drives this story and the spine of all of these books. Um, I wanted to also tell a story that had an intact family. And you know how hard that is. Yeah. It's much easier to write about a single protagonist alone, abandoned, orphaned, searching for his parents. It's much harder to tell a family saga. But I felt uh, called to do it. It kind of fell out in the writing. And the family enriched this story in so many ways. The great Aunt Lucille, his great grandfather. And I always tell people, it's, it's the, the, the scope of the story is sort of Percy Jackson meets Indiana Jones in The Exorcist. That's sort of what this story is. And, um, but it's a, it, it's, I hope it becomes also, and I've, I've seen it in the early letters we've gotten from early readers, it's a conversation piece for kids, for their parents, and it really is about how we as people rely on the choices of the past, the choices made by our parents and our grandparents, mm -hmm. and how, for good or ill, that shapes our destiny and our future. And we, we can't ignore that. We can, we can change it. We have the ability to change it. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the, the, the right to ignore it. Yes. And if you do, you run into awful problems. <laughs> and Will, Will straddles that, that middle place. He, he wants to go in his own way. But he comes in contact with his great-grandfather's legacy. And, um, and how he fits into this prophecy that he uncorks quite by accident. Well, uh, you've, you've done all that very well. And uh, the relics featured in it, how did you choose them? Oh, boy. The relics uh, in this book, I wanted one to be, uh, have real mystical power. They both have, have supernatural powers. But the first one was the finger bone of St. Thomas. And um, you're familiar with an odd Thomas. And, uh, and there, there actually is the, the finger bone of St. Thomas in a church in Rome. You can find it in the Church of the Holy Cross of Jeru in Jerusalem. So I wanted relics and antiquities, and throughout the book they're scattered, that you can actually see in museums, in churches, because it's important for us to reclaim these touchstones, understand what why these were venerated, what they mean today to us. Because I think they aren't only part of a Christian heritage, they're part of a Western culture. And I think literacy demands that understanding, historical literacy. And so it's a, that, that's why I chose those two relics. Uh, the second relic is the uh, relic of uh, the mantle of Elijah from the Old Testament. Now, the mantle has been lost to time, but in my book, it's in the museum, in Perilous Falls. And we know from the name of the town, it's going to have a lot of dark adventure. Yeah, well, you don't <laughs> want to spend too much time in Perilous Falls, but th there's a sunny side <laughs> when he's not unleashing horrible things on the populace. And Will has a supernatural gift. He, he does. sees demons that others see, find invisible. Tell us about where did that come from? And oh. Well, I wanted, I wanted Will to have a supernatural gift. and. Um, I liked the idea of a child who saw what nobody else could see. <laughs> and, um, and how that gift, which he, he initially is running from, since the time he was five, he's been seeing these little shadows. But as he ages, the shadows hold. And when he turns to look at them, they actually have form. And they're becoming clearer to him. And in the book, they become all too clear. And he can even interact with them. What we find out, and I don't want to ruin it for everybody, but this gift is part of a prophecy, and many people have been waiting a long time for Will to come along. And it, it really, again, this is one of those things that I never intended, but I discovered in the writing. The gifts we're given are not ours to keep to ourselves, but we have an obligation to perfect them, to nurture them, and to share them with others. And Will learns that lesson in the course of this story. And, um, and there are all kinds of, I mean, other people have written me about the allegories they saw in his sight. But uh, some of that, you know, I think is just part of the story and not necessarily something I put in there. So I always think, and I'm sure you agree with this, we do 50% of the job by committing the story to paper. The other 50% happens in the reader's mind, in their heart, in their soul. And um, 
uh, it's been interesting to see the reaction of people mm -hmm. to the work. And it's often not, not, the, not the reaction you had to it, <laughs> right? You, you sometimes, we, you mentioned earlier about children at that age being able to fall away in their imagination quicker into right. a story. One of my, one of the things that frustrates me most is I will get letters from readers who will take a book like Ashley Bell, my recent yeah. one, and there was something to say, I just couldn't possibly believe that. And I would say, <laughs> but you see, that's why it, starting with the audience you're starting with is so satisfying. Right. And that is, I sometimes think, somebody like that, because as a reader, I can believe anything right. if the writer does the job. Exactly. Uh, so I always think that if somebody says that to me, they, they, their imagination was never honed. It was always mm. left undeveloped. Yeah, they don't want to go on the journey. They don't yeah. want to go on that imaginative journey. And that's, uh, that's sad. I mean, it's I very feel sad. very sad yeah. when, when people won't go down that path. Well, thinking of going on the journey, the Will yes. Wilder series almost didn't happen, but it ended up at Random House. Mm. Tell us about that. It did. No, that, this, <laughs> this, my journey to get this book published was almost as treacherous as Will's to get the relic back <laughs> that he, he, you know, loses at one point in the book. Um, initially, this book was at another publisher, and due to disagreements, I bought the rights back, which is, as you know, <laughs> something a writer almost never does, probably shouldn't do, and you only do when, when it's, it's a dire situation, and in this case it was. But my agent at the time, Loretta Barrett of Happy Memory, said, um, I've never had a client do this in 35 <laughs> years, but I think you're right to do it. Yeah, I, I, I think you need to do it. You need to save the series. So I bought it back. And then only a few months later, my agent died of a brain tumor. Oh. So I'm here with this book that I've worked seven years on. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I approached some publishers with it. One was really interested. And a friend of mine said, let me take it to Random House. I said, Chip, my friend Chip Flaherty, I said, Chip, I've been publishing at Random House for 10 years. My editors there say, this, this type of middle grade adventure fiction is just not what they're looking for. But if you want to take it to Random House, fine, have at it. But I'm already talking to some other folks. Well, he took it to Random House. I get a call a few days later from Barbara Marcus. Now, Barbara Marcus will probably mean very little to the viewing audience. She is the Wizard of Oz of children's literature. Barbara Marcus is the woman who not only bought, acquired, but launched the Harry Potter series when she was at Scholastic. You know, the midnight signings, the, the, the rollout of the book, the whole thing. I mean, she brought Harry Potter to America. So she really has a very sharp eye, and she loved the series. She said, we want to publish this. Um, kids are going to love this adventure, and I love the concept of the series. Why did you want to acquire the Will Wilder series for Random House? I think there are several reasons. The first is the first tenant. I thought children and boys and girls would really like to read it. Um, it's a great read, it's a great romp, and that's really important because we want kids to read. I actually think it's going to fit in quite well to the marketplace because of the adventure aspect and because it is really sort of a thrill a minute, great family, great adults. So in some ways it has sort of the cornerstone of every solid series. The other reason we wanted to publish is it's that interesting balance of adventure and history, and that to feed children real facts in a fun way is really a wonderful thing to do because they need that balance. What do you want kids and all readers to take away from the Will Wilder series? I want them to feel um, empowered, both from the reading experience and from what Will is willing to do and that what even more his friends, who are clearly terrified, are willing to do for friendship. I want them to take away some learning. I learned a lot reading the book. I did not know the things you are talking about in the book before I read it. But really, I want them to come away feeling satisfaction of a wonderful read. And I think that's what we have, we will be, you have given them. And I think that when kids get to know Will, they will see themselves in Will because he is not perfect. He is flawed, but he is, wants to do the right thing and has an, a wonderful sense of adventure. I can truly say, in 10 years of publishing, I don't have anything near the Kuhn's track record, but I have never had a publisher and an editor, Phoebe A. at Crown, my, my editor, uh, Emily Easton, 
I've never had a group embrace a work like this and so champion it on all fronts. I mean, they have really brought their A game to it. I, I'm, I, I'm humbled that uh, Barbara and the whole team you know, has so taken this under their wing. And it is, of course, the perfect home for Will. It's just the perfect spot for him. Now, and they'll do a great job. Oh, well, that's right. We're at the same publisher. Yes. Now. And yeah. uh, that won't redound to your disfavor. No, either. no, and it, and it hasn't uh, so far. Why should boys and girls read this series? Hmm. Uh, for a number of reasons. I think, first of all, boys are going to relish this adventure. I mean, it is, it's a romp. Um, there's a lot of satirical fun around the edges. Will is a kind of, you know, um, he's a wise guy. Uh, he's a kid who doesn't believe things at first sight. He's, he's shrewd. Um, he also has this ability, though, when he feels he has to do something, he throws everything at it. He abandons uh, all reserve and kind of takes his friends with him, and they go on this fantastical adventure. Boys are going to love that supernatural ride. The girls are going to, I think, love the ride as well. They're also going to love the characters here. Aunt Lucille, the great Aunt Lucille is kind of, she's a surprising character. I can't reveal everything about her, but uh, girls are going to love her. She's a strong female lead. Uh, his friend Cammy, Will's friend Cammy Merriweather is also, you know, a really smart, sharp kid. Uh, I think kids are going to want to go on that journey, and there is so few places for them to go where they can take part in a series, have something to discuss with their friends, and it challenges them in one respect because they're encountering history. They're encountering history at every stop. And even unraveling some of the challenges requires a little understanding. Mm -hmm. So they learn along the way. Uh, one, of, one of the early readers said it, it reminds them of, you know, uh, national treasure. You know, it has kind of that yeah. chase yeah. quality about it. And uh, you have to unravel the, the, the riddle to get to the next chamber. There is some of that here. Um, and then there's the supernatural dimension that I thought important to put in the work. And so for all those reasons, I think kids are going to love this series. And the letters I've gotten, Dean, have been um, so gratifying and touching. I got a, a, a fifth grader wrote me, Braden wrote me, and he said in the letter, every, on every page I felt like I was with Will. In fact, I felt like I was Will. And he said, and what I learned is that a 12-year-old can really change the world. And then he can do something else and restore everything back to normal. <laughs> and, and I thought, this is why I write. This is exactly why I wanted to write for kids. It is, it is uh, touching them and reaching them. And if I got no other review or no other letter, that would suffice for me. I mean, it was just one of those great, beautiful letters. One of the things I, I loved about this book was something that I now and then get criticized for. And they, oh. say, uh, they say, your children are always so smart. Uh, they're always so engaged. They're, mm -hmm. they're mature beyond their years. I don't think that's true. No. I've known many children like the ones I write about. Uh, but I, I think I don't see it very often. Kids are, when adults are not writing for kids, or even sometimes when they are, mm -hmm. they sort of write down. Right. You didn't do that. No, 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 no. Kids are very sharp, particularly yeah. today, Dean. I mean, I see it in my own kids. I mean, the nice thing is I have, you know, I have my, my children and their friends became my test audience for the book. I would write a chapter and then read it to them. And let me tell you, they are brutal critics. <laughs> That's boring. Why are you putting that in there? That Take that out. That character's stupid. But I really like this one. And I'm like, you like that one? So, you know, I went back and I yep. rejiggered things. But it was amazing watching their reaction to certain moments of the book. And they're a lot smarter than we give them credit mm -hmm. for. So I thought, you know, I'm going to write the children that I've encountered my children and their friends, and they're really sharp. In fact, sometimes they're smarter than the adults I know because they're seeing deeper. They're seeing in a different way. And Will Wilder has that ability as well. Yeah. Well, it, it really works. And Thank it's, you. Uh, now, families should read this together, I think. Well, it's, you know, there's been a lot of letters I've gotten from families where they, the kids come to the parents and say, you know, is this true? Is there a <laughs> finger bone somewhere in a play? It encourages that kind of questioning. And the, the parents are going to get one story here, Dean. It's like reading a Dean Koontz book. Mm -hmm. You can take the ride. It's a great story. The plot points are fa fascinating. They're cliffhangers and turns. But if you're looking for something else, if you have the eyes for it, mm -hmm. there's an entire other narrative here. So the parents, I think, are going to come away with one story. The children are going to take quite another. And I hope 
my goal is. It's the type of book that I love and that I read as a child that you can mature with. And when you go back to it as an adult, mm -hmm. you see things you never imagined and had, had it, you totally missed on the first reading as a child. Yeah. And that's what I want for the Will Wilder series and I hope um, is in place. What book or books oh boy. in your childhood had that powerful effect on you never to be forgotten? Mm. Well, one of them, the one that, uh, the two that always stick out, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I loved. And the other was uh, Charlotte's Web. Oh, Those yes. were the two kids' books that, I, that left the deepest mark on me. Uh, Charlie, because, uh, you know, he was such a, he was a character. I, I didn't know poor people like, like, like Charlie. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you really felt so bad for Charlie Bucket in the beginning of that book. And then, of course, he's the one chosen. I always tear up when I think about it. He's the one chosen, you know, of all the kids. And they've got the wealthy kid and they've got the other kid. And it's, it's simple, humble Charlie Bucket who's the one plucked up and brought into Willy Wonka's world. And then, of course, he's given the key to the kingdom at the end mm -hmm. because he was the only one who was true. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that book, is, is, it's magic to me. I've always loved that book. And, of course, Charlotte's Web because it, it's beautifully written. Yeah. And, um, and the lesson there about every life having such worth, even animal life. Mm -hmm. Every life is, is used for, is necessary. Every life is necessary for an important end. And it, and it all ties together. And I love that. It's, uh, I read Charlotte's Web as an adult. Really? And was moved to tears yeah. uh, when the, the little pig and all of Charlotte's babies start hashing and they're all floating away and he's not going to have any more of Charlotte. No. And, but then, of course, he does. Because, yeah. 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 And it's, uh, I thought that was just a piece of genius I to know. do that. I know. You know, E.B. White said he, he came upon that. He was walking into the farm. And again, this is the eyes that, uh, that I hope people reading not only my series but your work, uh, any, any work of fiction that is truly engaging, that it gives us the eyes to appreciate the wonder of the world again. Mm -hmm. You know, my friend Richard John Newhouse used to always say, the world is far more wonderful and filled with miracles than we ever imagined. And that's what I hope my work is filled with. E.B. White walked into his farm in upstate New York one day. He was cleaning out the slop for the pig that they were going to kill. <laughs> And he looked up into the corner, and there was this little pod up there hanging. And it was a spider's pod filled with little eggs. And he was fascinated by it. And he would check on it every day. That's where the whole story came from. Ah. But it was the, his eyes seeing the miracles all around us, that this little cottony patch hanging from the corner of his farm would create thousands of little spiders that would then go on and spread spider webs and, and, and continue life all over his farm. The recognition of that, that little thing, created this timeless story that has touched generations. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Yeah. It's, you, you once asked me in an interview uh, how the, uh, getting a dog affected my life. Right. That was the key thing. I'd gotten to a point in my life that I didn't look as closely at the mundane things. Uh -huh. And when you walk a dog, the dog wants to smell this, wants to look at that. Mm. And the dog takes its own pace and it opened me up again to all of that. Wow. And I always say in interviews that the one thing I want people to walk away from anything I write is a sense of how incredibly full of wonder and mystery the world is. Mm. Uh, because that is, the, if you can recognize that, and it's the thing that people blind themselves to. I agree. Because it's scary. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a burden with seeing things yes. as they are. But there's such wonder and beauty that we're, we're missing, and our children are missing. And I don't want, I hate when kids are sitting around a table, and they're all, this is the kid. Uh, yes. You've got four kids and a parent. We were at dinner last night. Who, they're, they're cutting themselves off from precious time with mom and dad, moments of engagement and an understanding of the world that they will miss, they'll never get. This book, I really wrote it so that those generations could reconnect and we could excite kids again about the wonder, the mystery of ourselves, of our history, and of the world around us. Yeah. Well, you're, you've done a job. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, George Martin, who is oh, yeah. very successful <laughs> at the moment, uh, says there are two types of writers. Yeah. There are architects and gardeners. Mm. Do you agree with that? I know which one are you. I kind of agree with it. I know Dean Koontz is a gardener, but I'm a, an architect. I think. 
I'm, you know what it is with a series this large? I don't know how you did the Odd Thomas series of eight books and kept track of all those characters without outlining to some degree. I still don't understand. I never outline. Never outline. You just keep it all in your head. Mm -hmm. Character ticks, taglines, all of that. <laughs> uh, you, you have a much better, you, you know what it is? It's... Your mind is better than mine. I have binders. I have character binders. I have a, a schematic of, of broken down by chapter. And then there's a column for each character. And I make notes in that just to keep myself straight because the, it's so overwhelming, I would lose my way. Now, I, I'm not a slave to that outline. Mm -hmm. The outline is just a guide. Many times, as yeah. you said, the story starts turning on you. Will tells me something else, and I've had to just throw away part of an outline. But it gives me the confidence to dive in. I don't mm -hmm. think I could have started this series without laying out outlining the first book extensively and all the subsequent books, I, I did the same. I started out writing outlines for the first dozen or more books, but uh, uh, eventually gave them up. And by the way, I bought back 20 different books of mine. You did? Yes, I'll tell you about that. Okay, someday. later. <laughs> Another episode, don't miss that one. Uh, if you could write anything else, what would it be? Mm. Harlequin romances, I think. No, 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 I would write bodice rippers. No, I would write, um, I would write a mystery series. I've always wanted to write a mystery series, and I have one rattling around in uh, the back of my head. Uh, I've got a great protagonist, but I, 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 with Will, I don't have time to, mm -hmm. you know, to bring that protagonist quite to life. But I, I will eventually. It's it's a it's a it's a good story. I love the characters, but. Um, I loved mysteries since I was a kid. I read mm -hmm. all the Agatha Christie books. I read Rex Thank Stout, Rex the Stout. Nero Wolf. Yes. What a great, he's, he's another one that I'd want to invite to dinner, yeah. Rex Stout. Um, th th just the form of that and to propel a character through time, mm. 40 books, 50 right. books with the same character, Rex Stout, uh, Agatha Christie, uh, James Lee Burke, a beautiful writer, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Again, who captures, they, they, they capture that world, and you want to go back, but to keep it fresh for so long. Very difficult. That's a very difficult challenge. Very difficult. I, one of my great pleasures in life was being asked to write an introduction to a new edition of a Rex Stout book. Wow. And I felt very honored and wow. sort of like, I better not mess this up. No, don't mess that <laughs> one up. Are those great books or what? They are. I love Nero Wolf. I've Wolf. read every one of them. Archie Goodwin. What three characters. books for the middle? great readers would you recommend they read? Ah, books that I would recommend. Um, I love Wonder, which is a fairly recent yeah. book by, um, yeah. by Placido. That's a wonderful book. And it's about a, a boy with deformity that um, teaches everyone around him something. And I, lo I just, I love that book. Um, uh, there's a Mar Charlotte's Web, of course. Peter Pan I love. Peter Pan is probably one of the most beautifully written books. That's one I weep every time I read it to the kids. Every t they can almost predict it. In fact, my oldest will go, uh-oh, daddy's <laughs> about to cry. Here it comes. And sure, I turn the page. And then they went back to Neverland. She was too old to fly. I always, that, that breaks me up. I don't know what, I, I think I know what that is. Sometime I'll tell you. There's a, there's a, there's a family story connected to it that I, I think it triggers that emotion. But... I, I've always loved the, 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 the wonder of Peter Pan. It's an adventure. It's really about growing older and life mm -hmm. and, uh, and, w and when it's time to leave the things of childhood, which, is a, which I haven't quite passed I'm, yet. I'm not there. I was wondering, when is that? No, that's <laughs> not going to come. When, when they put me in the ground. Best advice to parents to get their kids to read more? Oh, this is one of the, the goals of Storyented. Um, it not only features interviews with best-selling authors and influential authors, but we really want to inspire life, a lifelong love of reading in kids. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, there are two great things. First of all, I think every parent should take their kids to a bookstore, every parent, or a library, and let them free roam. Let them find the things that interest them and then talk to them about it. Figure out why and then help guide them to those books in that area. Things they might like, things that will challenge them a little bit. The other thing that really that inspired my love of learning, I'll tell a little tale. Up until fifth grade, Dean, I really was not much of a reader. I read comic books. I read comedy books. I read little things. I didn't really read novels, books, short stories, but not books. 
I had a fifth grade teacher uh, in New Orleans, Brother Raphael, and he did a marvelous thing for me. And this would be my bit of advice for parents, teachers, anybody. He picked up an Ellery Queen novel. Ellery Queen was a, were mm -hmm. two writers who famously wrote multiple books, and uh, Ellery Queen was the detective in it. But uh, Brother Rayfield did something so marvelous. He read the book, maybe two chapters. So the murder happened, and there were all kind of uh, uh, red herrings. And then he said, and Ellery Queen walked onto the scene. He closed the book. He put it at the end of his table, and he said, gentlemen, if you'd like to know how the story ends, the book is here. <laughs> uh, and we're all, uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's like getting to the end of, uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a movie, and they suddenly kill the, the projector. So naturally, we all, you know, elbowing and popping each other <laughs> to get to the book. And that was what really started my love of reading and, and launched everything, every, everything from there on. I can trace it back to that moment mm -hmm. because I would never have gotten into the theater. I would never have loved reading or writing or had the respect for it that made me want to eventually do it had it not been for that one act. Mm -hmm. So I hope people use that. Uh, attendant to that, one thing that parents should never do yes. is say, you can't read mysteries because they're trash. You right. can't read science fiction. or horror or whatever because it's rash. I heard that as a child so really? much. And that usually comes from people who've never read any of those genres. You're right. And of course there's trash in anything. Right. But there's also fine work in anything. You are right. And so just trust the child that is developing They'll pace. find their way. They'll find their way. Look, we had a teacher, one of my sons uh, had, a, had a teacher. I don't think I'm telling too big a tale. So they, won't, they won't kill me. Um, and the, the teacher told him, what are you reading? And he said, well, I'm reading the Kingdom Keepers series. I say, oh, you, why are you reading that? What are you reading that for? You should be reading Tolkien. Well, wait a minute. Uh, he, he, he can read both. Mm -hmm. He can read, and we, and we encourage him. I told the teacher, look, I encourage him to read everything, not mm -hmm. just one thing. And I worry at times, if you force a great work upon a child not ready for it, yes. they will never go back to it. Mm -hmm. People make this mistake with Shakespeare. Now, I love Shakespeare. I, I, I hear Shakespeare every day. I, I mean, as an actor, it was always in my mouth and my ears. I, I, when I'm driving, I have great, you know, highlights of Shakespeare, Olivier and Gielgud. I put it on in the car. I love hearing that. However, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think if you don't immerse people in it at the right moment when they're ready for it, you'll lose them forever. They'll never go back to it. There was a lot when I was growing up as a kid of pushing Shakespeare into you in junior high. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've often said that probably the most hated novel of my generation was Silas Minor, because <laughs> we were forced to read it, mm -hmm. and it was no interest whatsoever to kids right. our age. No. So that, I don't think I could ever go back and read Silas Minor, and I'm sure it's... Yeah, it's a perfectly good book, but, yeah. but it, it turns you off to it. Yeah. And that's why I, I wanted to capture kids in writing this, the Will Wilder series, I spent a lot of time studying where these kids are, what they're looking for, and then how do you meet them halfway? How do we give them an adventure, something that's nourishing, thought-provoking, challenging, but takes them on a real ride, one they want to go on? Mm. And uh, I hope a lot of reluctant readers will find it, and it seems that's happening. My thanks to Dean for such a great conversation. Dean Kuhn's latest novel of suspense, Ashley Bell, is available at bookstores everywhere. And I want to remind you that book two of my Will Wilder series, Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonders, is on its way. We just unveiled the cover. It will be available in bookstores March 7th of 2017. You can pre-order it now at Amazon, EWTNRC.com, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, wherever books are sold. And thanks to all of you who've read Will Wilder's first adventure. And if you haven't, well, now you can catch up. Well, that is all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And you can also sign up for my free e-blast right in the middle of the homepage. So do sign up. It's all there, RaymondArroyo.com. Join us next week. I'll be talking with Bennett Umalu, the Catholic doctor who discovered CTE, the brain disease caused by concussions in the NFL. And children's author Jonathan Oxier will discuss the value of great storytelling in his latest book, Sophie Choir and the Last Story Guard. 
Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.